from the first part of the sermon It was talking about the Christ It compared the Lord with lots of things like that Well, we want to prepare the table for communion, so let's uh, do that right now. Let's see if I can get my slides up here. We're in the book of Hebrews. Take your Bibles, turn to chapter 11. I always love when the Lord brings the passage. I'm an expositor, so what I do is I just continue to preach through a book, and God is the one who tells me what I'm going to preach each week. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to worry about it. I just prepare, study, because God gives me the text. But I love it especially that when you come to a text, and it coincides with communion. So I have in our passage a, a really good communion text that was just perfect for today, and uh, hopefully I'll get there, but I'm going to kind of switch things around a little bit. We only have like really maybe two, two lessons left in the book of Hebrews, so uh, we're looking forward to this. Uh, so turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13, and uh, I basically i am continuing these last week and the next couple of weeks as I've been titling this message and saying, hey, how much of your love is showing? And we talked about the fact that we're living in a context today uh, in the middle of this COVID-19 con uh, conflict uh, that has totally changed our lives completely, like we have never known. It's almost like, is this, was this planned? I mean, it is totally has, has unraveled not only the United States, but the entire world. Uh, we were just talking this morning about travel for Thanksgiving, it's messing everything up. Uh, new regulations happen each week from our state. And when you go to come back, and then in California, you can't even, you're now limited to how many people could come into your house for Thanksgiving. And, and then I heard the crazy one is that when you're at, around your Thanksgiving table to eat turkey or whatever, you got to wear a mask and then eat between bites. And uh, what is this all about? And it's crazy. But this church was in the middle of a tr crisis themselves. They were being persecuted. They were mostly Jewish Christians. They came to faith in Christ, but many of their Jewish families rejected them, which in Jewish Judaism, they would have a funeral for you. And their occupations, they were fired from their jobs, and it was horrible. Then the throw on top of that the pagan, pagan persecution from the Roman pagans uh, and from um, Emperor Nero making it illegal to be a Christian, and the death, the, the death that was happening to believers, it was horrible. And in chapter earlier, we saw in chapter, I think it was 11 that, or 12, that they were being, they lost their properties, they were on the run, it was horrible. And so in the midst of natural crisis and cultural pressures, it can become very easy to neglect our social obligations and personal development of the Christian life. Because we're so, we, we back up, we shut the doors, and we're in a survival mode. And we're fearful, afraid to reach out, afraid to reach out to our neighbors and, and do the things that we know as Christians we should be doing, loving one another, loving our neighbors as ourselves. And so this passage, it's the end, the, the last chapter, and the writer of Hebrews is basically a series of commands he throws out uh, to bring the readers back to the basics of love, to back to the basics of living the Christian life. And you know it as well as I do in the last months, your life is different. You, you, even your, your, your life with your neighbors on your street, you, know, you don't do the things you do. You kind of stand back, you know. Uh, I, I, met, I, I admit, I saw someone, and, and I could pick up, pick up on the road as a hitchhiker, which would be an opportunity. I said, no way, you know, that guy could have COVID, you know. And, and, and all these decisions we make, you know, we, we don't get involved in. And so this is the situation they were in and we're in today. So just quickly to review what we did, we were talking about these uh, commands. First, we saw that the, the writer said us how Christian love should be seen in compassion. We should, not, we should love continually brotherly love. That's a command. Don't stop loving one another. Don't stop doing what you used to do. Keep doing it. And then he talked about uh, we should have compassion not only to the saints, you and I, but we should have compassion to strangers, you know, people you don't know, aliens, people who are, you know, and then he talked about, you remember that some have entertained angels unaware, like Abraham. God commands you and I to be loving to strangers, not worrying about the COVID. I'm sure you don't have to be dumb, but you can still love and show hospitality to strangers. 
We also talk about compassion, uh, compassion seen to those who suffer. Remember those that are in prison. We talked about prison ministry. There are those that need to us to visit them or those in the nursing home, those in the hospital, those who are shut in, the elderly they can't get out of their house. We need to remember them, help them, call them up. You know, that's why in the very beginning of this thing, we were very sensitive to find out everyone's needs. If they needed groceries, we still need to do that. We kind of have kind of faded that away a little bit, but we need to still look out for each one another, those who are suffering during this time. Then we talked about Christian love seen in, in chastity. That is in marriage, in purity. We saw that the command here is that God says marriage and purity must be one. God is the one who invented marriage. No one else. The government didn't invent marriage. It's God's invention. It's God's institution. And some even have said it's God's, that it's almost, that, that should be considered an ordinance. of the, And it's God. And the government should not be in, getting involved in that. And look at the mess we're in. And it's to be pure. To be one man, one and one man and one woman for life in a monogamous relationship, pure. Any sex outside of marriage is sin. And we talked about that. And, and then we talked about marriage and, and judgment. God says there's going to be a judgment come for those who defile his ordinance of marriage. That those that, that scorn and mock and make ridicule, and, and, uh, and he says, God will judge the sexual immoral and the adulterous. And then we talked about Christian love seen in contentment. What is that? He talked about keep your life free from the love of money. You need to be content in your situation. You need to know that godliness with contentment is great gain. And that God has put you in a situation and God knows all about your situation. That doesn't mean you can't pray if you need money or if you need it. But we shouldn't be covetous. The love of money and covetousness is wanting more than what you have or wanting something that God hasn't ordained for you. And covetousness was the last two commands of the Ten Commandments. Covet not thy neighbor's wife, covet not thy neighbor's household, house, their ox, their donkey, whatever. So contentment is important. Be content with what you have and realize God is sovereign in what he gave you. But he also says that, uh, that contentment uh, is, uh, is, love is not covetous, but it also it means that uh, love is, is contentment. The opposite of covetousness is to be content. It's to say, God, thank you. I am grateful. Every day I give thanks for what you've given me. I thank you for the blessings. I'm thankful for the gifts that are given. And, so that's, and, we, and we show love by that. Then we saw Christian love is seen in courage. First of all, God reminds us here that Jesus, the Lord, God, the Trinity, will never leave us nor forsake us. You think about that? God promises. It's his promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Nowhere, not anywhere in this world can you go and not be apart from the presence of God in your life. Now, that's a promise for Christians, not necessary for those outside the family of God. But I'll tell you what, I am glad for that truth. No matter what situation you're in, Christ is with you to help you. And then he goes on to say that we can need to have a, uh, the courage is based on, uh, uh, excuse me, the, the courage is based on this verse. So he says in verse 6, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Some say that's a quote from Psalm 118.6. It's also a reiteration of what Moses told Joshua before he went to the land. He says, he says, be courage and strong and courageous. Do not fear, for the Lord thy God is with you all the time. There's nothing we can fear. He's our helper. What can man do to me? Can't do a thing except by the permission of God in his life. Then we start today, the new portion. We're talking about Christian love seen in consideration. What do we mean by this? Christian love seen in consideration. Look at verse 7. It means, first of all, seen in consideration for Christian leaders. In verse 7, the first part, it says, for what Christian leaders have taught. Look, at the, look what it says here. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. I love that. Especially a week after you did Pastor Appreciation Day. I think you remembered your leaders, at least some of your leaders. Maybe you didn't do all the elders or deacons, but at least you, 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 you blessed Sam and I, and we're thankful for that. But the word remember, what does it mean to remember? Uh, 
I remembered, I remember Tom, I remember Sam, no, it's just, just in, no, the word remember has a very definite meaning, it means to respond to your leaders, it means to be mindful of your leaders, so to remember your leaders, it means to be mindful and to be responsive to their, their leadership in your life, that's a different spin. But you know, it also is an idea of remember those, and I think there's nothing wrong with remembering and holding dear in your memory the leaders that you had in your life. They think back of some of the great, some of the pastors you had, some who may be a missionary or someone that God put in your life to make was dear to you. I have a picture here of my dear, a leader in my life. You can't see him, but this is my, his name is Pop Lambert. He's Pop to me. This is my Christian spiritual dad. We were talking to someone last week, and they said, well, he's a brother. Yeah, he's a brother, but a, a Christian father, a Christian dad is a little, big, a little stronger than a, a brother in Christ. He poured his life into my life as a father, and, and our relationship was like a father and son, very deep. It's very affectionate. This man, I owe my li- a lot of my life to him. And in the beginning of my life, he discipled me. He taught me. I spent so much time with him in the day that he would, in a natural way, say, don't do that. Do this. Don't. Hey, you dumb cuff, what are you doing? You know, that man is dear to me. And I remember tremendous, it is, I, I, probably a week doesn't go by that something doesn't come up that I can hear the voice of Pop Lambert saying, Tom, Tom, no, no, Tom, or telling me something loving. And him and his wife, his wife, whose name was Augusta, his first name was Height. Height and Augusta, what names? They showed such hospitality to me. Uh, to me. They were the head of a Christian serviceman center with, with sailors and uh, soldiers that they loved and had in their home. When Shelly and I got married, we were down there all the time. She, they endeared, brought Shelly into their lives, and we knew them all the way till both of them finally died. And to the day that Pop died, I was there, spoke at his funeral, and those, we got to remember those. Remember these leaders for what they have taught you. Don't forget them. But also, we need to consider them and remember not only those who taught you, but also, uh, I think I have it here, what they have, oh, I think I have it at a uh, position here, what they have wrought in your life. Well, let me go back to this, this, this uh, quote. This is a quote from John Phillips, great, great commentator. I love reading his books. He said, a person who handles the word of God with skill and in power of the Holy Spirit is engaged in the highest and noblest profession on earth. You know what? I believe that. Last week, we were at the Eldon and Eugenia Messer's 75th anniversary, and I got to meet their, I think it was their grandson, may have been their great-grandson. His name was uh, Tristan, 11-year-old boy. And he came up, and he was very, just a very happy, very congenial, friendly boy. And I found out that he wants to be a preacher when he grows up. He said, I want to be a preacher. I want to be a pastor. I said, whoa, you don't hear that many, much anymore. And this kid was, he says, oh, man, I want to preach the word of God. I want to be a shepherd. This guy was like 11 years old. But he says, I also have a problem. I said, what's that? He says, I also want to be a chef. Oh, you could be a preaching chef. So I started giving him some examples. I said, I love cooking. I said, you know how much cooking I do at a church? I'm cooking all the time. So then I bragged about how I keep winning the bake-off every year. And everyone says, don't make cheesecake. I says, I got, a, I got killer cheesecake recipes. Oh, yeah. I said, yeah, I just cooked the men's breakfast last. I'm cooking another one. And he says, really? I says, oh, you do a lot of cooking as a preacher. You can be a preaching chef. So he was all pumped up. Praise God for that. But I told him this. I said, Tristan, I just want you to know I'm serious. The greatest, to me, the greatest vocation in life and the most rewarding is a preacher. It's the most noblest profession there is. When I was in the Navy, I, I thought very serious. I wanted to go into some a profession in my life that would save people's lives. All my life, Growing up, before I went to the Navy, I wanted to be a fireman. I wanted to be a New York City fireman, big time. 
I, I, I was getting ready to take the test. I was ready to go through the whole thing. I was ready. I, I had all the applications. I had a cousin of mine who was a captain. I had, oh man, I, I wanted to save lives. In fact, I went into the Navy, and one of the things I did in the Navy was a damage controlman, which is a fireman, which is a guy who saves lives on fire control and fire, uh, all that kind of stuff. But all of a sudden, when I became a Christian and I started being discipled by Pop, two friends told me that they were going to a thing called a Bible college, a Bible institute. I said, what in the world is that? They said, it's a place where you can go to not learn nothing but the Bible. Anything that the, the Bible, you're going to learn it, and it's to prepare you to serve God. And then all of a sudden, they gave me a catalog, and I started reading, and I started reading about what it meant, the pastoral studies, the pastoral major, and that I could dedicate my life not only to save physical souls, but I can go on to a profession that is going to save people spiritually from hell and bring them to heaven. What greater ministry is that? To bring people to heaven with God. And I said, Lord, that's it. I found my calling. I want to, to me, that's the greatest calling on earth. To be a preacher, to preach the good news. And huh, here I am, still going at it. It's great. It's awesome. And then it's, we also have to uh, uh, give consideration for what Christian leaders have wrought. Look at the second part of the verse. It says, consider the outcome of their way of life. These people that were your leaders, what, look at the outcome of their life. What, what was the fruit? The word outcome means to, to go out or to exit. The end of their life idea. How do they finish? Did they finish well? Hey, I'll tell you what, one of the prayers I have, I've prayed this many times in my life, and I've even said it in pastor fellowships. Lord, if I will ever sin or do something that will bring shame to the name of Jesus Christ, that would horrify and harm the name of Christ in my life, if I fall into a sin that would harm the name of Christ, take my life now. Can you pray that prayer? I've prayed that many times. Take my life. I do not want to shame the Lord ever. Please, if, that, if it is up, take it. We have to be careful of how we, our life. We have to finish well. And then the next thing here is we got to see Christian love is seen in consistency. You're, th those leaders that you remember were probably people who were consistent in their life. But here is the ultimate example of consistency. Look at verse 8. This is one of the greatest verses in the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. That means he never wavers never changes. There's a doctrine, we call it the immutability of God. The immutability of Jesus Christ, he never changes. This is so practical. And so the beautiful thing is, how is Christian love is seen in consistency when we follow the example of Christ? In fact, the verse before that, it says, mimic or imitate their faith, the, those leaders that you remember. The, that's a command. Mimic, imitate. Remember little kids, when they followed you, they would want to do exactly as a daddy. They'd follow you. If you mowed a, you mow in the lawn, you, want, you got one of those little Fisher-Price lawnmowers, and they would be right behind you. They even wanted to dress like you and kids and grand, your grandkids. We had to mimic the faith of those that served us. But here, we have got to mimic the consistent life and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Never wavers, never changes. The same. Think of the life of Christ. No matter what part of his earthly ministry, whether he was being uh, persecuted by the Pharisees, being confronted by the scribes and the doctors of the law, and trying to get him to stumble, whether it was standing before Pontius Pilate and being accused, whether he was being whipped by the Romans and his flesh being torn off him, or with the crown of thorns on him, Every effort, he did not change. He did not get angry. He did not fly off the handle. He was consistent from the very beginning, from the start of his ministry, from the miracles, to the dealing of the apostles, with dealing with the Judas Iscariot, 
all the way through every iota and every moment and every second of his life, he was the same. How can you be the same? Because he was God. Friends, the application is that is that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever in his attitude and his love towards you and me. No matter how many times you sin and fall, every penalty and judgment of sin that you caused Jesus to suffer for was taken and once for all completed at Calvary. He paid the price once for all. His love for you does not budge or alter one eye odor. It doesn't wave. He doesn't love you more or less. He loves you consistently the same. His eternal love is the same for you and for me. Get back up, confess your sin, and say, Lord, thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I don't have to worry about your love or your concern, and I don't have to worry that you're going to smack me and beat me up. Thank you, Lord, that I can get back and, and right in the path. And I thank you that sometimes that love means you might chasten me, you might discipline me, but that doesn't mean you hate me. That means you love me, as we saw in chapter 12. Friends, this is a, a, a very freeing doctrine, the immutability of Jesus Christ in your life. I can't tell you how many people that just like, they like feel like they're walking across a lake in thin ice and they're afraid that they're go it's going to crack. And yet the sign says, ice two feet thick, no problem, go. But we'll crawl on our hands and feet. Oh, I'm afraid. God's word says it. I love it. It's so important. And, and, and no matter what you did in the past, no matter how heinous the sin is, God loves you, and it's forgiven. It was the, the, the justice and judgment was paid for. It's over. Now, out of love, serve him. Out of love, honor him, praise him, worship him every day of your life. And now we want to go to seven. Christian love seen in conviction, verse 9. And we're going to have to go fast here. I just, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here. But this next command is, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. You hear that? Do not be led away by diverse. That's various in character. Having a great diversity of variety of errors. Don't, don't be led away by crazy things. Don't be led away into strange, aberrant teachings. Weird, alien-type teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by what? Grace. Grace is the issue. You know what? We have to be careful. And, and, and he was telling these readers to be careful. You see, they've been, they've been, been attacked because of the Judaistic and the Judaizers who are trying to say, you've got to go back under the law. You've got to go back and be circumcised. You've got to eat certain foods. You got to go back under the Mosaic ritual purification laws. You got to go back under the ritualistic laws for food and preparation for food and all these Judaistic errors. They would constantly be invading the church and they would have been confused and they're being tempted to go back to them. He says, Don't do it. Don't do it. Be careful. Watch out. John Phillips says this He says, Any doctrine that is not true to the person and work of Christ is a strange or alien doctrine. Christ is the all. Christ is the issue. We got, that's why we as pastors have got to, and shepherds and elders have got to warn the church. We've got to protect the church from error. And error comes in from all kinds of ways. I praise the Lord to Pastor Sam here in the beginning of this month and the end of September preached through the book of Jude. The book of Jude is the perfect book of an example of how to contend for the faith and how to uphold the faith and the doctrine which we're taught and to be be very careful and when being warned of the doctrines that could come into a church. And these people were being attacked. I saw a cool Peanuts, uh, Peanuts cartoon this week. And uh, uh, it was uh, Lucy and Linus together, and they're looking out the window, and it's raining. And Lucy says, boy, look at it rain. What if, what if it floods? What if it floods the whole world, she says. And then Linus says, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that it would never happen again, and the sign of the promise is the rainbow. And then Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. And then Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing that. Isn't that awesome? 
Sound theology has a way of lifting the weight off people. Let me give you an example that's connected with Noah's flood, just to give you an apropos, kind of political. Oh, global warming. <gasps> global. You know what? Do you know by two, some said by 2025, now they're pushing it to 2030, they're now going to 2035. Do you know that all the coastland cities, New York City, San Francisco, all of the cities of the world are going to be underwater. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Al Gore started it, but it, it is going to happen. All the, It is going to be flooded. There's going to be a worldwide flood. Well, thank you, Linus, for sound theology. God is never going to flood the world again. You believe that? Next time you see a rainbow, thank God. And, talk, and say, goodbye, quacky theologians. But now let's talk about communion, and we're going to set the table up. It's kind of a confusing passage here, and uh, we want to look first at uh, the communion, what the principle of communion seen here by the writer, and what he's doing is he's, it's, it's a very Judaistic culture here. He, he's, he's talking about the whole system of sacrifices and of, sac of the altar and how the high priest and Yom Kippur, and so the writer says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Well, what altar? The Bible, and the Old Testament's got over 400 references to an altar. There was, a burnt, there was a burnt altar for the sacrifice where they cut and shed the blood and they would burn the offering. There was an altar. There was the, the, the Holy of Holies, which was an altar where the high priest would sprinkle the blood on, the, on the, the mercy seat of this beautiful gold box with the cherubim looking over once a year for the sins of the priest, the high priest and his family, and for all the people. And, and, and that was to take away sins once a year to cover the sins of the people so God wouldn't remember them. But for the New Testament saint... The altar is not an altar. Now, we have here with this communion. We call it a communion table. Some churches call it the altar. <gasps> and some churches, I grew up in a church that you don't mess, you don't touch, you don't go near it. In fact, we, the church I grew in, they had like a, a, a guardrail in front that was like no, no for a lay person to go. You an ordinary, if you are not a priest or an altar boy, you don't go past there. I literally believed I was going to get struck by lightning if I did that. And that altar was like, whoa, and it was like something almost magical in my mind and fearful. And I'll tell you, I, there was times I thought I was going to get struck by lightning. Friends, the altar, this wooden table is just a table. The altar that we go to is literally Calvary, the cross. The altar that we serve is Jesus Christ and the picture of him on the cross, shed his blood. He was the offering once and for all for sin, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. The Calvary's cross is the altar. When we come to the table today, what we're doing is the table is remembering the Passover table, which also represented the, the, the lamb that was slain for Israel and the blood that was put over so that God would pass over judgment of every individual because when God sees the blood, he passes over you in judgment. And the blood of Jesus Christ was applied to the doorpost of your heart, your soul, when you by faith believe him and God says, I see the, my blood on you. You are cleansed, you're washed, you're redeemed, you will not be judged. So the altar that we serve is Calvary's cross and the death and the burial. All that's the altar. And, and there's no reference in the New Testament of altars and us doing that. And what's even better for us, he's going to talk about the temple and the city. Their whole worship system was based on an altar. It was based on animal sacrifices. And the other thing it was based on, it had to have a place to do the sacrificing. There was a place. It was the temple, and without the temple, and before the temple, there was a tabernacle, and it was, you had to do that. And so the writer goes back and he says, okay, listen, here it is. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right. We have an altar. It's Calvary's cross. It's the empty tomb. It's all that represents. The unbeliever has no right to come to it because they have no relationship with God apart from Christ and the cross. If you're trusting in the, in the animal sacrifices and the priesthood and for him on Yom Kippur to go into the temple once a year, guess what? You're lost. 
You've got to come to the true t- altar that is Jesus Christ. So then he goes on to say this, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. What he's saying here is reminding them, and these Jews knew this. If you have a Jewish background and know that, the, the, the animals didn't come in past the opening gate. They went to the burnt the bronze altar, the burnt offering altar, they would shed the blood and kill it, and, and they would pour the blood out, and they would burn it, and then they would take the, the, the animal outside the camp, away from the temple, or away from the tabernacle. Because it was only the blood that was brought in, presented by the priest for the people. Jesus Christ was rejected by the nation of Israel, by the high priest, by the leading priest, the Sanhedrin, they, they rejected Jesus. They did not accept him as their Messiah. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. He fulfilled every passage and prophecy about the Messiah. And they rejected him. The, the, the amazing, the, the unbelievable sin of rejecting the Messiah, rejecting the Son of God was seen. And what happened was they gave, made him carry a cross and they kicked him out of the temple area, out of the city, and they put him in a place called Golgotha. Not far from the very area with all the, the sacrifices and the leftover parts of the animals, they, they went into the Kidron Valley, and it's a, they, were, they were burned. It was like a burning garbage dump. Jesus, Golgotha was very close to that. Jesus suffered because it was a picture of them rejecting him. But guess what? That rejection became our altar. So he says here, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy holies by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin is burned outside the camp. Then verse 7, 12. So Jesus also suffered outside the camp. Isn't that interesting? He suffered outside the camp. So we see the place of communion. It's interesting that over in Isaiah 53, verse 12, it talks very important that Jesus was not only outside, but he was numbered with the transgressors outside. Remember this verse in chapter 12, verse 12 of 53? Therefore I will give him, this is the Messiah, the many, give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty spoil because he submitted himself to death. It's not about the death of the Messiah. And then it says that he was numbered with the transgressors. Numbered, and the word means among the rebels. When Jesus died, guess who he was between? Remember? Thieves on the cross. That was prophesied. Outside. It was seen as a curse. Galatians says he became a curse for us. Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. So what they thought was a cursed death for us, being outside the temple, in a, in a, it, was a, it was meant to be a blasphemous thing. And then between malefactors, they thought, aha, see, we're, we're, we're purposely, we're giving it to you. We're giving you the death you deserve, Jesus. But it says he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. He said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that awesome? And so the writer of Hebrews is saying that, that Jesus he was outside the camp. He became a curse for us. And he was, he was, he was buried with uh, and, and died with, with rebels and malefactors. And it says, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to set apart, sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Our identification with Jesus means we might... We're going to associate and identify with his reproach. He's saying to these believers here, you know what? Your identification with the reproach of Jesus, being rejected by all the people around you, the Romans, your Jewish brothers and sisters and family, you've got to pick up and realize you're taking a reproach for Jesus and you've got to do it. Because he set you apart in his death, burial, and resurrection. Because you came to the true altar of Calvary and believed and received that redemption of sins through his blood shed. That's awesome. And then he reminds him here, lastly, it says, remember this, 
He says, uh, for, verse 14, for here we have no lasting city. Don't worry about it. I know you may be persecuted here. You're going through persecution right now. Many of you lost your homes. Many of us may have lost our even lives, our heads chopped off by Nero, whatever it is. And we may go through persecution, but guess what? This life is not hit. This is not where we're going to stay. This is not our city. And it's what's interesting here. This is only maybe 64 AD. And remember, six years from now, the temple in Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The Romans would come in, 70 AD, Roman Titus, the emperor, the general, destroyed. Not, Jesus prophesied not one rock will remain above another. That This temple will be gone. It happened just as Jesus said, and it's been that way. Jerusalem has been that way for 2,000 years. There's still no temple built for the Jews to this day. There was no sacrifice for sins. There was no priesthood. There's no Yom Kippur. They, they, they come up with their own new rules, but it's not the word of God. But here, God. but here he reminds the people, listen, verse 14, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Friends, our home is not here. Don't put all your eggs in a basket here. This is not where it's at. This is not your inheritance don't build your life up here. Remember I told you a few times, like put a tag on everything you own and put it temporary use only, for temporary use only, for temporary use only for the glory of God and his kingdom because I have a home far better than this. And so when we come to the table this morning, remember this. Our Lord was outside the city. It was a, a shameful death. It was the Roman crucifixion. And the, even under the Old Testament law, it said, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Now, some say, well, he was on a tree. Well, he was on a wooden cross made from a tree. Don't, don't get too technical. He was died on a tree. He was hung. And it was a cursed death because he took the curse on him so that you can be set free from the curse, the curse of sin, be cleansed and washed. So, wow, hallelujah is right. So with that, let's go to the table of the Lord and celebrate communion. Yes. Chapter 9 says, Christ is the Lord's high priest, thus he saves us eternally. There were fancy words and lots of things that I can't And the writer was Some possibilities Might be Barnabas, Paul, Luke Or Clement or Apollos You see, I've been through the letter From a source with no name It fell in between Paul's words and James And the experts They can't tell whence it came But the ancient ones Call the Hebrews by name 